Listen to these words from the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to be reading from chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. While they were talking about this, and that this they were talking about was a story earlier about two disciples walking on a road to a place called Emmaus. They were talking about that. And Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? Why are you frightened? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that I, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he said, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And see, I am sending you what my Father, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Just how long has the idea of the rapture been around? You know, the one I'm talking about, the rapture in which only the so-called saved will be beamed up into heaven. <laughs> Just when did this idea get baked into the Christian story? This idea has deeply influenced the Christian church, its promulgation, the way people outside the faith see us, and so much more. This idea is not even 200 years old. It was never something Jesus or Paul or any of the disciples ever referenced. I know Paul and other early Christians had great expectations that Christ would come a third time. That's right, a third time. So let's count his birth. Birth, resurrection, and then another showing up again. Let's count his birth, because his mama certainly does. Other early Christians had a notion about the risen Christ returning, but they were usually a little more circumspect about it. The vast majority of people in the ancient world considered Christians, this new religious cult of Jesus followers, simply a blip on the spiritual hit parade. They were not a popular group. And there were many reasons that they were persecuted. Persecuted people will often look for a way out. A way out. So what, where did this notion rapture even come from? How did it, this become so foundational for what I think is way too many Christians in the modern era? Well, you can thank Nelson Darby. God bless him. Nelson Darby in 1830 decided all by his little lonesome without checking if maybe he might not understand things correctly or interpreted the scriptures very clearly, he decided that the single little phrase in 1 Thessalonians made obvious the Christian escape plan. He even had a name for it, rapture. I don't know how he came up with that, but that's what he called it. As disciples of Christ, our denomination, we value interpreting the scriptures for ourselves. That we all have the right and the responsibility 
to engage in the scripture, in the text. But sometimes that's done to the exclusion of listening to the rest of the community, and even to the exclusion of listening to the text itself, like, hmm, when was this written? Who may have written it? Why do you suppose it was written? The social historical context. Community, the congregation, the church, is the place we work these things out. Not by ourselves in a hermetically sealed vacuum, but in the messy work of communal discernment. Paul and other early Christians were absolutely convinced, knew in their heart of hearts their truth, that Jesus was returning in their lifetime to take them into glory or make everything in the world right, or both. It didn't happen that way. It did not happen that way. Still today, people will say things like, well, I know in my heart of hearts that this is true. My intuition, my gut tells me, I know my truth. Well, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. That's why we need the slow, patient work of communal discernment. Now, humility is required. The gospel story, all four versions that we have, the gospel story is not a blueprint for an escape plan. Jesus is not your escape plan. Jesus is our engagement strategy, our participation plan, our employment plan. That's right, our employment plan, because being a follower of Christ is a vocation. It's our divine appointment and employment by none other than the creator of the universe. Well, maybe you didn't realize that you signed up for that when you said, yes, I'll follow Jesus. I'll take that job. I didn't. It's something we grow into. We grow into and grow up in that as we grow up in Christ. Jesus is not our escape plan, escaping to an individual peace and security, an individual salvation for me, myself, and I alone. Jesus is our engagement strategy because, folks, Jesus isn't coming back. Jesus isn't coming back because Jesus never left. That's right. Christ is here among us now, though we are blind and deaf to his presence, much like the early disciples that Luke writes about. They couldn't see or hear the person right smack dab in front of them to be Jesus. There were two disciples who walked all the way from Jerusalem to Emmaus, didn't recognize him. They walked with this guy all day long, and they didn't recognize him until they ate supper together. And even after those two told the others about it, they couldn't believe it when Jesus showed up where they were hiding out. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. And really, who can blame them? It's too fantastical. The writer of this resurrection story makes a point of Jesus' physical presence. Jesus invites them to touch him even. Touch me. See? Ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Then Jesus asks for some food. He's hungry? He's hungry. Well, ghosts don't eat. We learned that in Harry Potter, because none of the house ghosts eat at O's wonderful feasts in the Great Hall. And then Jesus gives them their marching orders, their mission. Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name, presumably Jesus' name, to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Luke is writing not just to you know, the first Christians. He's writing to generations. He's writing to us. We are the witnesses as well. So now you have the vocation of proclamation the telling and living of this gospel down through the ages now resides in our hearts to be proclaimed on our lips. And for what purpose? Well, the mission is open-ended. The only specificity, at least according to Luke, is to proclaim in Jesus' name 
repentance, and forgiveness of sins. Well, proclaim, that's simply to announce. Ta-da, announce this. Announce that this is so, it's already completed. Repentance, well, make a 180, turn around and find your way back to God when you get lost. Find your way back to God, turn around. Forgiveness of sins is pretty radical. Jesus got into lots of trouble for this one, for telling people, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. You can see. Your sins are forgiven. Because only God can forgive sins, right? And here, followers, that's also us, people. Followers are empowered to do what Jesus did, to announce, your sins are forgiven. It's done. You don't need a Master of Divinity degree. You don't need ordination. You don't need the psychological assessment or 16 competencies of mystery. Minis oh, it's not mystery. It's ministries. One has to pass muster on. I don't know. Maybe it is a mystery. You're a follower of Jesus, a disciple of the risen Christ. Your mission, at least according to Luke's gospel, is pretty clear. Engage with the people around you and announce this good news. Hey, do you want to find your way back to God? Well, let me tell you how I've been doing that over and over, because, you know, it is a process, let me tell you. Are you feeling the weight of regret and more? Well, you're, you're forgiven already. It's happened. Step into that grace. And yes, I know later on, Luke says, Jesus goes up into heaven and he seems to be gone. But Matthew's Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age. And John's Jesus tells Peter to feed his sheep and then says, follow me, as if he's still around. And Mark's Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation, there's that announcement again, of eternal salvation. There is no condition given for receiving this forgiveness, for stepping into this salvation. There is no precondition. They just are. Now, isn't that good news worth sharing? Many people want to escape the world as it is. They find it in distractions, addictions, and in Las Vegas. Oh, I'm telling you, the plane I was on two weeks ago from St. Louis to Las Vegas was absolutely packed. And for most of the passengers, it was their terminus airport. How do I know that? It was really obvious as they waited in the A, B, and C sections. These people, most of them, we were going to Vegas to party. I want to escape the world as it is, too. I made reservations for a place in Winslow, Arizona back in June of 2020. I just needed an escape plan for the 4th of July holiday. Oh my gosh, all the fireworks started in May. I was going nuts. Well, eventually, um, those reservations got canceled for what should be obvious reasons by now. But you know, having a possibility of a way out, it surely improved my mental health. Just having that option. God finds a way out of no way, and there are more people who cannot escape the devastation of the world as it is. And nor should we try. Nor should we try. This is the time we are in. This is the world into which we are born and called by Christ to engage. Let us make a U-turn and find our way back to God. Let us engage with the suffering and the celebration around us. Christ has not left us. Christ has not abandoned us. Let us begin again and practice the presence of Christ so that we may recognize this sacred presence that accompanies us every minute of every day, waking and sleeping.
Let us lay aside the weight that clings so closely. Lay down what James Finley calls the habits of the mind and heart that are claustrophobic and one-dimensional and, and hinder us from finding the love that we desire. Let us take up that which engages us in the presence of Christ, art, poetry, music, service to community, welcome of the stranger and alien, silence, or countless ways to engage Christ in our lives and in our world. These are the moments through which comes flashing forth our unexpected proximity to Christ's presence, just as those disciples in that upper room, hiding out, surprised by unexpected proximity to Christ. This is the grace that is woven back and forth through the whole pattern of life. So let us sensitize ourselves. Let us habituate our living to that. Amen.